Okay, so we're going to work on Revelation again this week, and I must say, to do justice to two chapters of Revelation in 40 minutes is near impossible. Today, Jeremiah took nearly three hours, <laughs> so I'll give it my best shot. Today, we're going to work on the army of God. So, who are the army of God? We are. We are. We are. Not necessarily a nice thought for some people because it means we've got to deal with some ugly stuff. The letters to the seven churches are found in Revelations chapters 2 and 3. And from my thinking, it's a fourfold prophecy. It might be more, but for now, fourfold. Number one's for the seven churches named. They were in existence at the time that this, these letters were being written. They were real churches. Ephesus was known as the loveless church. Smyrna was the persecuted church. Pergamos or Pergamum, depending on which translation you're reading, was the compromising church. Thyatira, corrupt. Sardis was dead. Philadelphia was faithful. We have an interesting prophecy on this church about Philadelphia. Laodicea was lukewarm. And then we have for the churches throughout the ages, from the time of Christ's death to the time of his second coming. So Ephesus represented the time around Jesus' death for around about 100 years afterwards, and Laodicea is the church that is characterising the age before Christ was tomb. A lot of theologians think we're in this age right now. So that's a bit scary to think that the church at the moment is lukewarm. And as for the churches of today, these sevenfold things that are going on in these churches appear to be like the um, ministry gifts that we got in that there are only seven problems within a church and each church will have one or more of these problems happening at some time in their lifetime. And it's also for our, us personally. So um, we are the body of Christ. We are members in his army. So we need training. Army training. God's army training. This is where the seven churches actually were. And you can see on this map, you can't really see the trail. There's a trail that goes from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's on a trade route. And it kind of struck me, each of these churches are on gateways to the rest of the known world. So it's kind of like they were still doing go make disciples, but it was like they were sharing with those travelling through, and those travelling through were going because they were going home or going to the next trade town or whatever. We can do the same. We don't actually have to leave our homes to go make disciples. We can just share with those that are coming through. So... Each of these churches, at the end of each letter, was overcomers will get. So what are overcomers? Overcomers are in a battle. You can't be an overcomer unless you're in a battle. There's nothing to overcome if you're not fighting for something. So as soon as you make a decision for Christ, you've joined his army and become a target for his enemy. John 16.33 says, I've told you these things that, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the victory's already won. We are victorious. Revelation 12.11 says, They, meaning the body of Christ, triumphed over him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. What came out of their mouth? They did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Death did not face them. They did it anyway. Victorious. They rely on God. Overcomers rely on God. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We don't need to be strong. God is strong enough. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
So in the Greek is nikaio. I think I said that right. It means to conquer, carry off in victory, come off victorious, hold fast to faith even when faced with death against the power, temptation and persecution of the enemy. That's a pretty awesome, powerful description of an overcomer. I always thought overcomers meant you had to do the hard work. Well, yeah, you do, but it means you're victorious as well. Like, woohoo! I'm on the winning side. Yes. Who else is on the winning yes. side? Yes. Right. So all these churches, some of them were going through some pretty bad stuff. So in Pergamum and Thyatira, there's a false doctrine, the teaching of Balaam, the Nicolaitans, and Jezebel, with a general philosophy which if you read the account of Balaam, every time he went to curse the Israelites, he blessed them. So he told the king, send in harlots of the country next door, to corrupt them. So if you can't curse them, corrupt them. In other words, it'll come, this attack will come from within the church, not outside. So they're hated by God. They're divisive, they're corrupting, all of those things that you can read up there. Not nice people. So what do we do about it? If we are one of those people, we repent. We test the prophets. How do we test the prophets? Any ideas? How do we test somebody that comes into the church, up here preaching, me for instance, how would you guys test out that I'm actually saying God's word? Yep, in the Bible, isn't it? Everything's got to line up with God's word. Another thing that came out in this is that they don't like to repent, especially Jezebel's spirit, will not repent. They don't see the need for it. That's a good indicator, isn't it? Which makes them unteachable. But that means, oh, and also Matthew 7 says you'll recognise them by their fruit. What's going on in their lives? How are they, other people responding around them? What are they doing in other people's lives? So, who are we being influenced by? What are we bringing into our eyes, into our ears? What are we spewing out our mouth? Are we being influenced by good people, by bad people? Oh, I'm being influenced by good people. Maybe so, but are they the right people for you? There's a lot of good people out there, especially the politically correct ones, are they the right people to influence you in God's army? Are you the right person to influence somebody else? That's the killing question, isn't it? How much does your life, your actions, your words influence somebody else? Is it a good influence or is it a right influence for God? So an overcomer's reward for these two churches that manage to do what God asks of them and repent, or didn't hold with those doctrines to start with. It was hidden manner to eat, a white stone with a new name, authority and power over the nations. So they need to recognise the corrupting influence in their church. They need to repent from allowing that influence or being that influence. Then they get to rule over the nations. Did you like my arrows? All bad stuff. Sorry. There's some bad stuff. Sardis was dead. And the scripture says nothing they do meets the requirements of God. He couldn't even say anything good about them. Every other church has got something good about them except Sardis. What to do about it? Well, this is something I actually learned about Revelation in the last couple of months. You think it's a mysterious book. It's got all these signs and symbols. You know, there is... Seven mentioned 54 times, seven bowls, seven trumpets, seven angels, seven horns, seven churches. What is that all about? Well, keep reading, it tells you. So, what do we do about nothing, a dead church? What do we do about it? The very next scripture says, wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I found your deeds unfinished, in other words, there's still room for movement, 
in the sight of my God. Therefore, remember therefore what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. There's your repentance again. Overcomer's reward means clothed in white garments, named in the book of life, and your name will be spoken before God by Christ. So you will be known personally and introduced to God the Father personally. That's pretty awesome. So rouse, wake up, rouse. Remember, remember what you need to do, what you receive, and repent. Laodicea was lukewarm. So much so they made God sick. Seriously nauseated. I think that's even worse than him being angry or him being loving. It's like, seriously nauseating. Spew you out of my mouth. And Christ was on the outside trying to get in. That's not where Christ is supposed to be in the church, is it? What to do about it? Revelations, again, gives us the answer. Buy from me gold refined in fire. What does it cost to buy from God? Anybody? Nothing. It costs, costs you, you. Does it? No material needs to pass hands. Buy from me that you may be rich and clothed well that you may be that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with salve. This city was known for its famous eye salve, so that, that was an, a um, thing that they knew what they were talking about. So in other words, what's coming into your eyes, what's coming out of your eyes, fix it, heal it, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous, repent. Behold, I stand at the door knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. So the overcomer's reward for this particular one was sit beside Christ on his throne. So we clothe, get rid of those nasty garments you're wearing, repent, and then share a repast with Christ. I did so well. Arms. You're going to be pressed even further later. Then we have a forgotten first love for Ephesus, and we'll come back to that in a minute. And then we have some good stuff in bad places. So the church at Smyrna was persecuted, and the church at Philadelphia had to deal with a synagogue of Satan, which turns out, according to the theologians, was the temple of Zeus, so it's false god worship. Revelations 2, 2 to 4. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. It sounds like a pretty good church, doesn't it? Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first from its place. So even though this church was doing all the good things, having lovely outreach, having lovely fellowship, sticking with it, dealing with any persecution that came their way, God was telling them, you're getting it wrong. You need to love me. You need to love me. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or clanging gold. Love is important. So what do we do about it? Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand. What is the lampstand? It actually tells you a bit in chapter 1. The lampstand is the church. If you don't get this right, the church will be removed. 
And it seems that Ephesus was having this problem because we know the book of Ephesians was written to the same church that this letter was written to. And they were expounded for the love they had for one another and the love they had for God. Now, just a few years later, they're losing it. And Ephesus, in the age of history, only lasted for 100 years. So shortly after this letter was written, they no longer existed as a church. So remember where you came from as far as loving God is concerned. Repent of being indifferent to God and repeat what you used to do. So he come on, arrows. are you ready? Are you? Remembering how my relationship with Christ was brings repentance and begins reconciliation. Renewing my commitment to prioritise my relationship with Christ and repeating what I once did will rekindle the passion. Reluctance to do this will result in my removal from his army. How scary is that really when it comes down to work? So let's deal with the scary, shall we? What did you do when you first fell in love? Tiani, what did you do when you first fell in love with Gary? Well, I spent all my time with him. Uh huh. What about you, Liam and Shakira? What did you do when you first fell in love? We were just doing constant communication. So, like, Yeah. What about you, Chris and Maurice? So, what did you do? How did Maurice know you were in love with her? And Maurice, what about you? <laughs> was a thing. Yeah. So what about when we fell in love with God? What did you do? Yeah. So you read his love letters. Just like if Gary had written one to you, you would have read it over and over and over and over and probably still have it. Gary's yeah, sitting there going, oh, do we? <laughs> so that's what we do, isn't it? We talk to each other. We spend our time together. We communicate. We really, we, we read love letters. What did you do with other people? Say, when you started courting and you got engaged, what did you do then? Did you tell anybody? Did you tell everybody? You had a party. Did we do the same with when we become saved? Did we become really enthusiastic and evangelise other people, even if your evangelism was slightly left of centre? We did, didn't we? So that was our first love. Are we still doing all that stuff? With our partners and stuff, are we still doing that stuff? Or do kids get in the way? Or does work in the way, or at the end of the day you're so tired you haven't even got the energy to spend time together. How many marriages break up because of lack of time together? That communication is gone. That constant talking to each other is gone. It's possible to resurrect a marriage using these principles just as the same as it's possible to resurrect our relationship with Christ. It's a little bit Martha and Mary. Martha was so busy doing stuff and Mary was sitting at Christ's feet. So don't be so much Martha that you forget to be Mary. Don't let doing in love for Jesus get in the way of being in love with Jesus. Because I can tell you from personal experience, being in love with Jesus makes the for Jesus so much easier. You don't have the energy to do the for Jesus without the with Jesus. You just don't have what it takes. So if you're really struggling, if I'm really struggling, stop and think about where your relationship, your vertical one is. Because when your vertical one's coming good, your horizontal ones will come good as well. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. 
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you know God, you know his will. If you know his will, you're not doing stuff you don't need to do. You're only doing stuff he's asking you to do. Matthew 22, 37. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And there's another scripture that says, And all your strength. And this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. If you love God with that sort of passion, with the whole of you, how can you help but not love your neighbour the same? And your neighbour is everyone that's not you. So the overcomer's reward, eat from the tree of life. It still exists. It was there in the Garden of Eden, and it's obviously still there because we're going to get to eat from it. Woohoo! I wonder what fruit it is. We come to fear nothing. Smyrna was a highly persecuted church, and this was another church that God actually had nothing against. He had nothing, he only had good things to say to them. He says, I know your affliction and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give your life Give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. That doesn't sound terribly fun, does it? And possibly in this country we're fortunate we're not going to be in this position, but somewhere in the world there is a church that is going through this right now. You saw that map up of all the cities of that were written, the seven letters were written to. It was in modern day Turkey. 2% of the population is Christian. Those churches that these letters were written to exist, but the churches in that country go through this sort of rubbish. So, what do we do about it? We here in this place can only pray. We can pray that those people will be strengthened by God. Ephesians 5, 16 to 17 says, Make the most of your time, because the days are evil. But do not be foolish. In other words, you don't actually have to put yourself out there unless God said to. There are things that you can do to keep yourself safe. But you understand what the will of the Lord is. When you understand what God's will is, you may not suffer great, as greatly as what somebody that's going to be going home might. Second Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier in Christ. Oh, yay. I don't know about you, but that just doesn't thrill me. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Who's our commanding officer in this army? So here we are, one little battalion, several other little battalions in the town, we all have the one commanding officer. Do we want to praise him? Are we striving to praise him? Are we doing what we're doing because we want to praise him? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? That's a good, stirring, encouraging verse for me. Jay, have you got Acts 14, 18 to 31 then? So what do we do in this situation? We rely, we rely, we rely. It's all about relying on God. Rely, rely, rely. If you've got to go. Proverbs 
verse 18. And carried 31. Yeah. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to he give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. But we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. On account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old and whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, why did the Gentiles rage, and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your they, they were gathered against together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And now, Lord, Take note of their threats, and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence, while you extend your hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So there you go. The government at the time were trying to stop the apostles from speaking out, and they did it anyway. And what did they do in response to the persecution they received? They prayed blessings. They prayed. They gave it all up to God and said, we can't do it without you. And when that happened, what happened? Holy Spirit came and opened their mouths. Boldness. So overcomer's reward, not hurt by the second death. Just a little thing about the overcomer's reward. It's not the overcomers of that church that only get that reward. The overcomers of the churches get this reward. So all the letters to all the churches get all the rewards. So don't think this, oh, that's me, or that's not me, or I'm not going to get that. You will get it. So, to hold fast to what you have, to Thyatira, Thyatira, I always say that one wrong, hold on to what you have until I come. And what did they have? They had love, faith, service, and patient endurance. To Philadelphia, I am coming soon, hold on to what you have so no one will take your crown. And what did they do? They kept God's word, and guarded his message, and had patient endurance. Just a short time ago, Krishan spoke a prophecy to Jay over this church that we were the Church of Philadelphia. How encouraging is that? We've perhaps got something to boost to fill, I don't know. And I don't know how that will work out in reality, but it's a good starting place, isn't it? So how do we hold fast to what we have? Here you are, you've got your first love happening. What ideas would you have to hold fast to what you have? Back to your first love, reading the word. If you don't read the word, you don't know God's will, do you? If you don't read the word, you don't know God's love. How can you hang on if you don't know your love? Anyone else got any ideas? Worship. Yep. Yep, putting it into action. Mm -hmm. So it's about standing our ground, isn't it? When we got saved, the devil lost some ground. That was the first battle we were major victorious in. The devil lost his ground. And it's now your ground. Stand your ground. Isn't that what they do in armies in wars when they take 
a certain section of land, they then fight to keep that piece of land. So stand your ground. Don't give up the ground on the basic core truth of the gospel. Jesus is the way, the only way. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Hold, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. How do we know God's promises? We read the word. We read his love letters. So we need to have regard for God's word. Retain what he says and remain where we are, holding fast like a little kid hanging on to daddy's leg, going, no, don't let me go, don't leave me. The overcomer's reward, this one is massive. Pillar in the century. It reminded me when somebody is a pillar of the community, they're hugely well respected. Their funerals are usually thousands of people in a big area. It's like they are the movers and groovers of getting things done in the community. So pillar in the century and you never have to leave. You have the name of God, the name of the New Jerusalem, and Christ's new name written on you. I don't like maybe catching this or something. I don't know. But I thought, Christ's new name. I guess when he comes back, he's no longer the Messiah, so he's got to have a new name, doesn't he? <laughs> it's like, okay, that's the new one on me. He's going to change his name. He will no longer be Christ, he'll be something else. So, new name. So, we kind of learnt that we're going to be under the pump a bit. It's going to be a little bit ugly, but we've got God on our side. So it's time to armour up. Now I know most of you probably know about the armour of God, but I wonder how many of you affirm it daily. Yeah. Most days I do. Some days I forget, but most days I do. So this is my way of affirming my armour. A place on the helmet of salvation. And it's not written in this order in the scriptures. It's just easy to remember when you're putting it on. I affirm the uh, helmet of salvation to protect the thoughts of my mind, to protect my salvation, to protect my identity in Christ, who Christ says I am, not who I think I am. I put on the breastplate of righteousness because I am clothed in his righteousness. I put on the belt of truth so I can see deception, that I can see God's truth and I can see what is not God's truth and I can have wisdom in dealing with them. I put on the shoes of the preparation of gospel of peace so I can prepare, be prepared to share your gospel when the opportunity arises. I have the shield of faith and I put it on my left arm because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, maybe swap about. Shield of faith, the darts of the devil, the fiery darts of the devil. I had a little vision of these darts flying at me with little little flames on the you know, like little balls of wax or burning wax on the end. A dart's not really going to kill you unless it hits you in a sensitive spot. If somebody, if you're in the pub and get hit by a dart, it's oh painful. If it's hit by a burning dart, okay, cigarette burn. You've got to get hit by a lot of them to be killed. They're just uncomfortable. But you put your shield up, and a Roman shield was full length. It's not just this little thing on your arm. It's like full length. You can hide behind it. Piff, 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 piff. You can hear them whatever. Mm -hmm, go on. Sword of the Spirit. It's an offensive and a defensive weapon. You can use it to defend yourself. You can use it to keep the enemy away, not just from you, but your family as well. And we are each other's family. I also add, oh, pray constant things. This is a reminder every day. Every day, pray constantly in all things. It is part of your armour. It is the war room. 
If you don't know what God's will is for you in that day, pop into the war room because that's where he is. Garment of praise. Isaiah 61. Garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness or despair. Some of us have depression issues. The best way to get rid of them or to suppress them is lift up your voice in praise and worship. Banner set before you. Psalm 60. I have set up a banner for those who fear you with awe-inspiring reverence and submissive wonder, a banner to shield them from attack, a banner that may display because of the truth. When you look at medieval-based movies and you've got this army heading into battle, there's always a rider out front, and most of the time they're on horses because it's medieval, there's a rider out front that's got a flag. He doesn't have any weaponry on him. It's a flag set into his saddle and he's holding it upright. The army behind him, and that person is the standard bearer beside the commanding officer, the army behind him will follow that flag wherever it goes. Christ is our banner, Jehovah Nissi. We need to follow him wherever he goes. Like the cloud of smoke in the wilderness, follow him wherever he goes. The glory of God at your rear, Isaiah 58, 8. The light, and your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. God has got your back. Christ is before you. You're fully armoured up. God's glory behind you. If God is for you, So how do you feel, guys? Are you all armoured up? Are you all ready for battle? I hope so, because you're already in it. I was trying to think of lots of R's to finish this. But I haven't got any. <laughs> so, maybe reconciliation. If you guys feel the need for prayer, to deal with anything that might have come up in your spirit today, don't take it home with you. Come forward. Jane, me, somebody will pray for you, with you. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being our commander-in-chief, for always being available in our war room of prayer. And Father, we thank you for the the good things that a church is doing and the warnings for, to be aware of in what a church shouldn't be doing. And Father, we ask that if there's anything in our hearts and in our minds and in this body that you've pointed out to the appropriate people and it can be dealt with. Father God, we just praise you for all the things you've done for us. We praise you for allowing us to be victorious with you. We praise you for the tree of life, the crown, the um, temple of yours, for all the rewards you would give us for being overcomers. Lord, we just pray that you give us strength and wisdom so that we may overcome for the battle that's ready to come, that you may open our eyes for the things that we need to do on a practical level in the future. And Lord, we just thank you for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.